Thank you very much, Chris. It's really very exciting to share this uh, kickoff with all of you. And in keeping with the format talk uh, that uh, has been a device for this conference, uh, I'm going to uh, guide you through this with a number of uh, key themes and concepts that we have been articulating in the work package on experimental models, uh, drawing both from published literature and from unpublished work uh, from our lab. So let me start with uh, the point made uh, by Korzybski that the map is not the territory, which I think is particularly apt to think through uh, the goal of lifetime and also its uh, key challenge. Uh, we want to build maps of disease dynamics. And we want to do so at a single cell resolution, at a scale that is patient relevant. And these maps, importantly, need to be actionable insofar as they are mechanistically validated. This, in turn, uh, grounds the centrality of experimental models uh, for the need to actually derive mechanisms. Now, why is, the, is this uh, important? Because, uh, of course, uh, the challenge of lifetime is uh, to decide how far and how close we want to get to the territory if the territory in this analogy is the real-life healthcare, so the real unfolding of disease dynamics in actual patients. Here, I think uh, it's uh, useful to think back to Borges' warning in this fantastic tale on exactitude of science, this dystopia of an empire in which cartography and map making becomes so precise and at such high resolution that it becomes basically completely overlaying with the territory itself and therefore completely useless. Instead, what we want to have is an iterative circle, a virtuous circle, in which we interrogate the territory through experimental models. We make maps, and these maps will hopefully improve the territory. They will invest the territory with this knowledge, and in this iterative cycle of insight and intervention, that uh, we really think to navigate this diet of map and territory. So we can uh, sort of outline this in more detail, the more specificity for lifetime, if this is one of the maps that by now you have grown accustomed to seeing, that many of our labs are, are generating, these are all the layers, in fact, some of the main layers that we would like to analyze in every single cell through the dynamics of disease unfolding. But which cells, how many cells, when and how often to actually profile, we really don't know yet. In other words, uh, at which layer or combinations of layers will the map be most useful and actionable? for these various aspects of uh, diseases in real life uh, will depend, of course, on a combination of factors, and these will be ultimately determined through the answers that we get through experimental models. So I'd like to uh, think through what models are in this context and for this aim uh, by juxtaposing uh, Archimboldo with his uh, amazing capacity of capturing humanness with creatures that uh, were not human, as uh, testifying to the incredible power of model organisms. Uh, and on the other hand, Vesalius, uh, the Humani Corporis Fabrica, which opened up human anatomy to a level of resolution that was unprecedented for the time, and which I think is analogous to the unprecedented level of resolution that we can gain now, also and very much through this process, uh, through this project, uh, because we can externalize bits of our bodies, of human bodies, and make them experimentally tractable outside largely through programming, reprogramming, uh, and organoid technologies. So I will start with uh, this uh, intro slide, which really captures uh, uh, the toolkit of organoids uh, from uh, the early beginnings of life all the way to the somatic cells, uh, representing the various ways in which organoids can be derived, uh, including, of course, uh, the cancer organoids. And throughout the talk, I will be uh, navigating through paradigm examples uh, from two disease areas, which are two of the main disease areas which are of concern for the European population, neuropsychiatric disorders and cancer, which interestingly pose different challenges in terms of what could and ought a model to be. Specifically, uh, in terms of neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, the attempt to recapitulate the architecture of disease brain regions to meaningful interrogate circuits, and on the other hand, in cancer, to capture the heterogeneity of tumor and microenvironment populations in target tissues. So where do we stand 
in the example of brain organoids. And here is really a summary of a field that uh, was unleashed uh, by the pioneering work by Jürgen Nublich that you will hear more about in just a couple of minutes uh, on cerebral organoids, and which by now I think can be uh, nicely summarized in three broad technological approaches building units, namely building organoids that recapitulate the composition of the critical cell types of the human nervous system, doing so through building instructions, including most recently actually engineering the instructions to actually polarize and to engineer an axis of the human central nervous system, and building blocks. So building different parts of the human brain in vitro and then connect them in what is increasingly called an assembloid paradigm. So, uh, in this first theme of capturing spatial temporal dynamics, uh, what can it mean uh, to get close to the territory in uh, the grounding analogy of this talk? So, this is data from our lab, uh, cortical organoids differentiated all the way to 200 days. Uh, and as you see, there is uh, an increasing and very gradual correlation, these are transitomes, uh, to the stages of post conception weeks. And this is uh, interesting that uh, the slope of these progressive correlation is very gradual. You see here instead the single cell transitomics uh, with a diffusion map and an annotated U map on, on, on pseudotime, whose animation renders uh, the progressive and stereotypical appearance of the various kinds of progenitor populations and neurons, which were benchmarked on the data from the in vivo human developing cortex. Now, uh, we then carried out. Uh, what we thought was a rather useful exercise, namely reinterrogation of all the data sets from all the published protocols uh, of brain organoids uh, to ask the questions, how can we benchmark these different maps? Uh, and what we find out is that uh, uh, whole brain and four brain organoids have uh, a higher velocity in the sense that they have an accelerated course. And this is interesting because it makes a point that is relevant for the whole field, namely that uh, different models, in this case different organic models, uh, are able to capture different aspects of a system at different velocities. And this, of course, may lend itself particularly well and they indeed can offer advantages or disadvantages depending on what you want to model. This is, for example, a relevant, uh, very recent insight that showed that accelerated differentiation masked autism at developmental pathways, which were only captured if you instead went more slowly through the initial paths of development. So we then asked, what is the reliability of such maps? And so we actually measured the variability across individual organoids, multiple normal genetic backgrounds, and multiple batches of differentiation. And as you see here, we actually nicely see that as they progress through time, these brain organoids match the freshly isolated cortical tissue, which is instead quite distinct from the traditional cultures into the, of the very same cells. And of course, an analogous point can be now made uh, for cancer in terms of this first key theme that I wanted to outline with you, which is capturing spatial temporal dynamics. So this is a brilliant work from the Chris Marine Lab, which actually developed uh, a faithful model of melanoma in mice uh, by ensuring that the cell of origin was actually in the epidermis, as it happens in the human disease. Importantly, this was done uh, with a combination of intravital imaging, which was then what primed the system to be interrogated in terms of lineage tracing. So this is an example of using instead an in vivo model to trace the lineage history of cancer. We have seen the, this morning also some other brilliant examples of that. This is instead uh, a very recent example, if you want, of uh, the complementary challenge. You have a tumor in a patient, and through a tumor organoid, you would like to keep the clock ticking to keep the time and the evolution of the tumor ongoing in vitro. And it was, of course, a big question, the extent to which this would be possible. And this is one, I think, of the most cogent demonstrations recently provided in the case of colorectal cancer organoids. This is instead another example from ovarian cancer, again, to highlight that different maps can investigate the territory and extract very different features. So this is recently from the Clevers Group, a platform of organoid from ovarian cancer, in which the goal was to recapitulate the polyclonality and the heterogeneity of this tumor. This is instead a symmetrical work from our lab, in which we have instead focused on the metastatic component of the disorder and asked what can infer from the organoids that only grow from individual cells. 
And if we compare them then to the same cells cultured into the, into the fresh metastasis, we actually find that these single cell derived organoids allow us to see pathways that were completely lost in 2D, but they were in, instead present in the original metastasis. This is another big theme, namely the convergence of single cell omics and organoid technology to feed into each other in a very virtuous feedback loop. So these are two great examples for the kidney and the colon organoids of works in which the single cell omics was used to reinterrogate the organoid protocol and improve it on the basis of that insight. And I would like also to emphasize this recent thought-provoking editorial, all models are wrong but some organoids may be useful, which basically reminds us that uh, beyond the, the obvious need to improve fidelity, what is increasingly decisive, and certainly for a project like this, is to actually tailor the sensitivity of the models to the specific physiopathological questions. And this should be one of the key axes that will certainly preoccupy us in the future months. Now, again, with the analogy of the map and the territory, uh, how can we make the territory experimentally tractable if the territory is the reality of human diseases? And of course, there the first key point is uh, the diversity of human genomes. This is a published work from our lab a couple of years ago, in which we resorted to the two largest cohorts of IPS lines uh, to actually compare and derive empirically grounded uh, criteria for the optimal IPS-based modeling design. And we found actually that uh, a lot of uh, previous insight had been based on a design that actually artificially inflated uh, a spurious set of differential expression, which was instead simply due to the heterogeneity of human genomes. So clearly, once we go into the messy territory of human genetics and human diseases, we need to take that into account properly. And so uh, that's why we were very happy when uh, we actually uh, tested the cortical organoid protocol that we use uh, and basically ask the question, where do we stand in this very important trade-off between homogeneity and complexity? In, in other words, uh, you want a protocol that is reliable enough to be able to be used with a lot, in fact, many human genomes. And so these are actually different lines, uh, different human lines, differentiated in cortical organoids, and you see the near mathematical reproducibility of the subpopulations that we get uh, at, at different time points. And so, of course, it was this uh, result that gave us actually the confidence uh, to then interrogate uh, the same model on a series of paradigmatic genetic disorders. This is just an example from two diseases that are caused by symmetric CMVs on chromosome 7. Uh, we built on our previous work that had established uh, this very large cohort of IPS lines. Uh, and by subjecting uh, cortical organoids from over 12 patients uh, and profile them through single cell uh, RNA-seq uh, at various times, uh, the important point here is that we not only found that there is uh, a clear symmetrical uh, uh, skew in the differentiation between the two CMVs, so the symmetry of the genetic lesion is recapitulated in a symmetry of delayed or accelerated maturation, but that in fact within the pool of the late neurons, it's really only a subset, a very specific subpopulation that is affected in one of the two disorders, an insight that we would of course have never arrived at without single cell technology. Now, what about however the need, as I was uh, alluding to before, to actually scale this up to the need of human genetics uh, and human diseases uh, of complex genetics. And so this is a recent uh, work in our lab that actually tried to multiplex organoidogenesis comparing uh, two different approaches, one in which we have uh, individual organoids from different lines, and then we mix them together just prior to sequencing as an attempt to see the extent to which we can streamline the cost effectiveness of the technology vis-a-vis -vis the other design in which we actually pull cells and we actually make chimeric organoids ra representing different humans in the very same specimen. And as you see here, we were actually very happy to see, again, both at the level of immunofluorescence with tag lines and through single cell RNA-seq, that there is a very good distribution, even at very late points, of all the lines that were actually contributing to the same chimeric organoids. Right. right. So, drawing uh, towards the conclusion, uh, 
This is instead another aspect, which I think is quite important for lifetime, namely making the territory experimentally tractable from the other side of the disease equation, namely environmental exposure. And here the question that uh, we addressed was uh, uh, through pairing up with uh, one of the largest mother-child cohorts in the world in which uh, women are profiled at 10 weeks of gestation, in this case uh, for their exposure to endocrine disruptors. And then the children are followed epidemiologically through seven years of age and deep phenotype at two levels for the metabolism and the neurodevelopmental function. And then uh, the exposure to these substances uh, is investigated, the mixtures is reproduced in the lab, and for us then the question became, can we now interrogate organoids, since we know that we can actually match the same developmental stage at which the women were probed, and test whether experimentally we find a difference between the exposure to the two mixtures, which I remind you had been derived on the basis purely of epidemiological inference for two distinct uh, phenotype domains. And the answer was yes, because we find that actually only the N mixture, namely the mixture that had been associated to neurodevelopmental outcomes epidemiologically, was the one that in organoids that were matched to the same stage was actually eliciting and disrupting uh, uh, circuits that were shown to be causative of uh, autism and intellectual disability. So uh, a final point that I would like to thematize with you is the integration of patient-specific and in vivo models because uh, those two images from Archimbold and Vesalius are really part of a fully integrated pipeline in lifetime. These are two very nice examples, again, one from the marine lab in which the use of PDX has allowed actually to highlight a specific and actual pathway that underlies uh, the uh, a minimal residual disease um, uh, uh, resistance to therapy, and a complementary approach, which I think uh, is also quite telling of the versatility of this combination, which Bars de Strooper actually used the patient-derived neurons and grafted them in a genetically modified mouse model of Alzheimer as a way to start scoring genomes that prime predisposition to Alzheimer. So as you see, a combination of, let's say, PDX and genetically mo modified mice, which are becoming the very informative uh, soil onto which to seed uh, the human-specific lineages. And so these are uh, the challenges ahead, some of the most outstanding that we have articulated for this work package uh, together with uh, Jürgen, Chris, and the other colleagues. These are uh, the outstanding tasks in terms of uh, the scientific objectives of the pro proposal and which, of course, pertain, as you see, both to organoids and to in vivo models uh, to actually map the, uh, the disease model areas to understand what are the key technological challenges that we as a community need to address in the coming years for both kinds of model and to actually use them in that mechanistic manner that I alluded to at the beginning through a new set of perturbation tools. And so we invite you very warmly to actually contribute to all of these tasks, starting of course from tomorrow afternoon where we will have the breakout session. So let me conclude by thanking, uh, first of all, uh, the amazing talent of the people in the lab. I'd like especially to highlight uh, Emanuele Villa, Leandro Lopez Tobon, Nicolò Caporale, and Sebastiano Trattaro, who are here, the authors of the posters that I, ha that I highlighted, and who have been shaping with me some of the foundational technologies uh, for uh, our lifetime ob objectives. Other key people in the lab uh, who contributed to the work that I showed today my work package co-leaders for articulating uh, some of these thoughts and ideas with me, a number of uh, wonderful collaborators and patients' family, would especially like to emphasize the enabling role that the Italian Epigen Consortium had, uh, headed by Pino Macino, together with Stefano Piccolo and Massimiliano Pagani, within which a lot of our organoid modeling work could develop, and of course, our funders, and you for your attention. Thanks.